because that's the other part about the festival, especially when it was physical and now definitely when it's virtual is it was very purposely in Austin. Like you could have been anywhere. We didn't want to be in LA or New York. We also didn't want Austin to feel like it was LA or New York. It was, you're in Austin and we, and we sold it the first year. You may not know who we are, but you're coming to Austin for the weekend. Like how terrible could it be? Do your panel and then go find yourself a delicious margarita. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Let's jump into this. Okay, we're an awesome episode. My guests are Caitlin McFarlane and Emily Gibson, G-I-P-S-O-N, okay? Not like the guitar. Um, they run something called the ATX Television Festival. So it's about TV, right? Hello. Uh, the website is atxfestival.com. We'll put the link in the description as always. Um, and look, this is a cool, this is a cool thing. So normally, right, they have film festivals. This is about uh, television, obviously. <laughs> so look, the, they met working in LA for Fox Studios and they decided, look, um, nobody's doing this. Nobody's putting on a television festival. So why don't we? Uh, and basically what it is, is right. You're taking the fans of TV and, and putting them together with the people that make them. So, you know, the, the, this is, look, my first thought was a film festival, right, is about bringing independent films and trying to get distribution uh, of your film, right? Someone buys it, someone sees it and wants to, you know, distribute it, right? Well, with this, this is a little bit different, right? They're, they're bringing shows that are already on TV, right? Uh, past shows, you know, doing things like that, uh, reunions, you know, that sort of thing. Now, they do have a pitch competition that we do get into, uh, so I talk about that in the in this episode. It's a really cool episode. Break this down, what it's about, what's coming up, how they got it started. And then we just talk TV. You know, what's cool, what's out there, what's, uh, you know, what what these are experts on TV, okay? So uh, they were awesome to talk to. Th this was a really fun episode. I'd love to have them back on just, you know, periodically just to talk, you know, television shows and what's out there and what's on and what's hot. And uh, they have a different perspective, you know, when they look at it. Um, so, and I love that. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool, uh, festival. Uh, it's virtual. So you're, you know, you can go to it anywhere in the world, right? You don't have to be there physically with COVID and everything the way it is. Um, th they're having it all virtual. It's coming up here in June. So you can get, it's, it's over the course of 10 days and they go into this, into the, into the episode. It's over the course of 10 days, but you can buy, you know, individual days and passes and that sort of thing. So, you know, a lot of cool stuff. It's really, really fun, really cool new unique and um yeah this is a great episode so you know kick back get a drink and let's talk tv this is a great glass of wine episode i would say get a glass of wine so okay caitlin mcfarland emily gibson with a p uh atx television festival again it's atxfestival.com okay look before we uh get to the episode here the interview with the uh with the ladies, um, a word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food. We'll be right back. Hi, I wanted to talk to you about what's on the Texas Real Food site that's more than just putting in your zip code and finding, you know, the coolest butcher, farmer's market, restaurant around you. There's also other resources on the site, recipes, articles, and one in particular is called the Texas Mom Blog. It's awesome. Faria Khan is writing these beautiful articles. You can really learn a lot about Texas, just giving you a lot of other things to think about. Food, family, everything behind that goes into food as well. So just different topics and uh, conversations. Definitely something worth checking out as well. All right, back to the show. And we're back. All right, thank you so much, Texas Real Food. Don't forget, check them out. Um, you know what I'm going to bring up social media, right? Before we get to this interview, 
Check us out online, Lone Star Plate TX. We are most active on uh, Instagram for sure and Facebook. Um, we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn, and we post on Reddit and stuff like that. Uh, but I guess I guess me personally, I'm most active on those. Uh, and of course, our YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, I think like 90% of our views come from non-subscribers. So please, if you're watching, you like this, hit that button. I know you like it. All we get is likes for the most part. So I know you're liking this. Boom, hit that button, hit the notification bell. We release new content every week, pretty much every day, actually. Uh, we're releasing new content. So yes, two new episodes a week. We break that down into clips and we have YouTube exclusives as well. So please check us out, Lone Star Plate Podcast, if you're not on YouTube right now. All right, let's jump into this. Uh, Caitlin McFarlane, Emily Gibson with a P. We're talking the ATX Television Festival. And for those of you that don't know, ATX stands for Austin, Texas. Okay, that, that's an acronym uh, used quite often in Austin. So, uh, yeah. All right, guys. Enjoy. Emily Gibson, Caitlin McFarlane. On the Lone Star Play podcast, we like to support other podcasts we like. So here's a quick word from a podcast called The Spark Parade. Art and entertainment inspire each of us in different ways. But have you ever wondered what inspires the people who create our cultural touchstones? On the Spark Parade podcast, your host Adam Muntz geeks out with artists and entertainers about their cultural spark of inspiration. Everything from Shakespeare to South Park. You'll hear from artists like Conor O'Burst on Northern Exposure, Roisin Murphy on Terrence Conran's The House Book, and Adrian Young on Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. The Spark Parade, where artists reveal their cultural inspirations to spark the inspiration in you. Find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, back to the show. So ATX Television Festival, right? Let's, uh, I tell you what, let's start with just y'all introducing uh, yourselves. We'll start there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm Caitlin McFarland, uh, one of the co-founders of the festival. And I'm Emily Gibson, the other co-founder of the festival. <laughs> right on. And it's just y'all two, right? Yep. Y'all started this. Yeah. Oh, nice. How big is the crew now? Or are y'all two the only ones that really focus on it? Yeah. You know, I mean, we're going into our 10th year, um, our 10th season, as we like to call it. And we've been <laughs> many different sizes at different times. Obviously, the last year has been a little odd, but there are four of us, including the two of us that are year round. Um, we have a director of programming and a director of operations. And then as the festival comes closer, whether it's virtual or in person, that team sort of grows exponentially, probably 20 of us staffed and then usually like 100 volunteers. Virtually, you need a lot less volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And it's easier for them to volunteer, right? The, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just at, their, just at their house. Yeah. I mean, how did, um, you know, with COVID and everything, is that affecting this this year's yeah it is we you know we went fully virtual last year with like eight nine weeks to to pivot i think for people in austin or texas or beyond uh south by canceling was the beginning of covid in our world in a lot of ways that yeah, mine was, too my yeah. that was like the the moment where i was like oh shit this is serious yeah. we all know we all know what that means for them to yeah. have canceled a few days before they started um being in events being in this town that was just huge and they had never canceled before right no and and honestly up until the moment they did it we were talking in the office that week as we sort of joked about things or not joked, but like figured out what, what world we were living in. Like somebody said, do you think they would ever cancel? And all of us were like, no, like that's what I said. No too. Way. Well, that's how could they, I mean, yeah. yeah. Canceling something of that magnitude. How could you actually cancel it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and that, you know, obviously it was in March. We're in June. We probably still for a few weeks, we're like, we're fine. We'll all be back up in a couple of weeks don't worry and then we watched the dominoes tumble and the world change forever potentially um so we went to fully virtual for we did three days free on youtube constant broadcast at that point it was obviously a big change to be doing virtual at all we had never done anything like that before and people kind of 
obviously we're very locked down. So we really wanted to be as immersive in it, as an experience as possible over those three days. Um, and the last year we've done a lot more virtual programming. Our audience has grown a lot bigger than Texas. It, it was before, but even more so now. Um, and so our year round programming, we've now like launched a membership so that we're, you know, constantly having conversations year round, not just oh, being wow. like a four day festival yeah. and being able to showcase TV shows and have conversations that aren't just time to June. Um, but when looking at what this year could be, we felt like we were right on that cusp, kind of being the first fully virtual festival last year. We were right on that cusp of, yes, something in person is possible, but planning for it is really not because getting people to Austin, our panelists, safety, travel, that sort of thing. So sure. we are our, our big shift this year is that we're doing 10 days um, and it's not constant. It's not 10 hours a day. People don't need to be glued to their screens that consistently. (laughs) Um, So we're working on like what those virtual um, sort of experiences are and being able to kind of, I hate using all of these like kind of overused words, but like elevate the experience. So it doesn't just feel like a bunch of Zoom boxes. Yeah. Be out and about in Austin a little bit more, do some live on location filming, some like small friends and family audiences. So that experience at home doesn't just feel like a removed experience. Our community is our most important thing. And so how do you engage with that community virtually is sort of our challenge. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Did you want to add anything? I don't want to. I would say, I mean, the biggest difference of even what we're trying to do versus what a lot of the festivals have done over this past year when they've all gone virtual is so many of the festivals this past year just because of logistics have had to mainly be on demand. So even though it's a set amount of time, it's a, here's all the content we have. Everyone's watching it this week, but you can really choose your own adventure. And because we really focus on how do we want to make our community, not make our community, but allow our community to come together and experience this together. So a lot of those 10 days and the reason we're shortening each day is so that there's really appointment viewing time. So at certain times on certain days, everyone is coming together we are watching something together. There's a chat going, there's opportunities for people to, whether it's on Zoom or other platforms we're looking at, be on and talk to each other and really experience the content because that's the whole thing. Even when we started the festival was television, something that you experience so much at home in your living living room by yourself. And we were bringing it to people, allow people to experience it together. So now we're back in our living rooms at home by ourselves, but how do we like keep experiencing it together and not lose the whole reason for the festival, which was to talk and have this community around it. So that's the most important thing to us. I like that. It's like, it's bottlenecking the excitement, you know, instead of having it just spread out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, that's smart. I mean, that's a smart, uh, and people like that, right? People want to have that uh, community experience um, if they can. No, that's great. We That's think great. so too. And we think, I mean, people obviously, when you see it now with the way TV works is people like to choose when and how and where they watch things, but absolutely. I mean, that's the new way now, absolutely. right? No, absolutely. I mean, that's what we all do, but there's also, you want to interact with each other. I think this year has taught us so much about how much we want to interact with each other and we don't sure. really granted. And now yeah. the great thing about what we get to do virtually is there are people that just logistically can't make it to Austin for the festival, whether that's 100%. analyst or attendees. And yeah. so this allows anyone anywhere to participate. And I think even going forward, which 2022, everyone's planning on being in person, who knows what happens in the world, <laughs> but there's still, now that we've done this and experienced this past year, we want to be able to still open it up to people that can't yeah. make it here for whatever reason. Okay. A good mix, right? I mean, I was actually yeah. going to ask that. Are, are you guys going to implement some of these things y'all had to do during COVID now with the in-person? And you might have this all around better festival because of it in a weird way, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's even as Kate was saying just a little bit ago. So our year-round events prior to COVID were really just in Austin. We would do yeah. things like Alamo Draft House um, or spaces around town, but it was really just for Austin. And then we had just started doing events in LA and New York when the world shut down. And so we're like, okay, well, there goes our year-round events that we had really just finally gotten out sure. of a local level. 
But then all of a sudden, virtually, we can now do year-round events everywhere. So yes, we do want to go back to in-person ones as soon as we can. But now that we're able to do these virtual events that incorporate anyone everywhere, we don't want to lose that. Yeah, it's absolutely. So much our our fan, our TV family, and what we're able to do, and the panelists we're allowed to bring in. And we've done now that's a good point. People in Australia and England yeah. and all across the world that we don't want to lose that. Yeah, yeah, you get access to to way more. Look, we did the same thing on the podcast. Ours were in person, you know, mm -hmm. in Austin. Yeah you know, at a studio there off South Congress and people would come in and boom, pandemic hits. And we were just going to stop the podcast. But then we we're like, you know what, let's pivot to, you know, online. And what does that do? It opened the door for anybody and everybody to come on the podcast, right? Wherever yeah. they were. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, no, I totally get it. And honestly, even talking on the podcast with so many people in different industries, sort of the same story of, you know, they had to pivot, they had to do something. And now some of those things they had to do, they're going to keep doing because mm -hmm. they they found that it, it worked and it connected them with uh, their fan base, uh, specifically musicians, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, okay. So this will be the, uh, what year is this then coming up? So this is the 10th one. So this is the 10th. Yeah. yeah. This is, yeah. Th which a lot of people, I mean, kind of same thing. Like Emily and I have a lot of people that are like, oh, but your 10th year is yeah. yeah. And we're like... Yes and no. I mean, one, we we thrive on challenges and newness, and this is definitely new. And we are looking to find the places that it's special and exciting and celebrate those 10 years. But it's kicking off a 10-year celebration. And now we just get to find new and inventive ways to do that because it means that we are still here 10 years later even after a pandemic. So we don't yeah. really see it as sad. We will find ways to hang out with people and have margaritas and breakfast tacos and barbecue, <laughs> and we will hug them and we will talk about television in person and we will do it all year long <laughs> and it'll be great. <laughs> I love that attitude. That's, that's it. Uh, no, that's great. So is that why y'all chose 10 days? I'm assuming, right? 10 days, yeah. 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. It seems like a brilliant idea at one point in time. Ask us at the end of the month if we still yeah. feel like it's a brilliant idea. And we it was Emily's idea. I know. That's oh, oh, she's oh, like, oh, it's really? Emily's idea. Yeah. It was. Everyone she gets all the credit it. and all the blame. Depending <laughs> on which way it goes. <laughs> Feels correct. I'll take I would take that deal. <laughs> I, I, I like that deal. Uh, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, okay. You know what I'd like to do is uh, explain for people who were like listening, like, okay, television festival. What does that mean? Is that like a movie festival? So people like bring TV shows they've made from home or how does that work? You know what I mean? I mean, obviously I don't think that's it or maybe it is. I don't know. Let's no. dig into that. Like, what is it? You know, what is it about? It is funny. I mean, I think since we started it, which Emily and I, like, we just had this idea and spent a year sort of going around pitching it. And people were like, it, it, it weirdly makes a ton of sense. And it is also a head scratcher for a lot of people. <laughs> like they don't quite understand. They're like, I've heard of a film festival and a music yeah. festival. They just can't quite get to television. Festival. <laughs> yeah. It is my, until they've come. And then it's their favorite thing, which is essentially it is a, a film festival, but for television, where we screen television shows and talk about them afterwards with the people who make them. But then we also do panels on a variety of topics of how things get made or themes or social issues, or we do a lot of reunions. So we're historically a third past, a third current, and a third premiere. So that past is reunions, canceled too soon, all your favorites, all the nostalgia. Yeah. People sure. love it. Um, anything that's currently being made, even if it's kind of off season and then we launch new shows. So the thing that we are primarily is we are primarily scripted. We do every once in a while, do some unscripted or docu series, but like 95 and a half percent is scripted shows. Yeah. Um, and we are, uh, I have to find new words for this, but like we're on <laughs> network studios and streaming devices. It's not independent television. If it is independent, if it's something like you made a, you made a TV show at home, sometimes we have an opportunity for that, but most likely, I mean, the last few years, HBOs are opening or closing night, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, all of those guys, TV in the last 10 years is also like redefining itself. Every other, you know, where Absolutely. is the line? between TV and film. And we are 
we struggle to find it sometimes and we talk about it. I think the other part, while we will sometimes have a feature length film of some sort, we are also 90 plus percent uh, episodic. So, you know, whether that's 22 episodes, 22 minutes or 112 minutes, it is, it has, you know, four to six episodes or 22 episodes. It is chapter based storytelling. Um, but yeah, I mean, up until the pandemic, it was in movie theaters and in, you know, the, the Paramount theater and in hotel ballrooms for conversations. Now it's, it's online. Um, but it's, it's fans and industry. It's like, it, it is everyday TV fan consumers who just love television and it's the people who make it who hilariously also love it. Yeah, I would say, <laughs> at, at our heart, we are, we call ourselves a celebration of TV and from the outside looking in, it looks very much like it's structured like a film festival. Just that concept of people waiting in line and going into a theater and whether you're watching a yeah. panel or screening, but the biggest difference is, I mean, film festivals really started as a place for independent movies to get distribution and for them Correct. to find an audience because they yeah. weren't going to be in theaters. Whereas that's not who we are. Like we are really celebrating TV that's already out there and gotcha. that already been made or is about to be on your small screens, wherever you are and really bringing together that community. So it has a different purpose to it as opposed sure. to it's still TV that either has an audience or trying to find an audience, um, which is great for us because we get to spotlight a lot of shows that we feel didn't get the acclaim that they deserve. We get to kind of put on a stage and hopefully help an audience find them. Unfortunately, some of them aren't with us anymore, but it really is a look at TV from all aspects and really diving into what it is. There are a handful of other TV festivals out there and they all have different points of view or different purposes. Like there is an independent TV festival that just screens independent pilots that are looking for homes. And looking oh, wow. For yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are ones that are much more like very heavy industry focused on like how to get into television where sure. ours is really for fans of TV, which is, as Kate said, half of them are industry and half of them are just people that love television and are interested in the behind the scenes, but have zero desire to work in it. They just yeah, totally. love the story. Would you guys ever think about adding an arm that that does focus on trying to get people signed or whatever, right? Get their show out there. Um, I think we've talked about it before and we've definitely shown things that were independently made. Um, oftentimes that's coming from sort of established television makers. They've just sure. gone a different direction. We did a show yeah. called Everyone's Doing Great. <laughs> great. Everyone's Doing Great um, that two actors, writers from a show One Tree Hill did, and they made it independently. They raised the money on GoFundMe or Indiegogo, and it sold to Hulu this year. So like we've, we've been a part of stories like that. The place where we want to be, uh, you know, we do, we're very passionate about, you know, breaking down doors and giving people more access and spotlighting people who maybe need help finding their way into the industry. So we have a lot of partnerships. We've worked with Sundance Episodic Labs and The Blacklist, um, and we have a pitch competition. So rather than say, oh, go no. make your pilot and now let's help find a home for it, it's more finding writers and getting them access to the industry. And we, it's not an official mentorship program, but um, the finalists and the, the winner and the runner-up, we end up pairing them with writers. Because I think the thing with TV, while there is still an exception to the rule, if you go make a, a really amazing pilot or short that might help you sell your show. You do still need studios and networks to make it. Um, yeah. YouTube exists and that is a very specific thing. But unlike making an independent film where like you could do a really amazing job and then a studio buys it and distributes it, TV, the pilot's just chapter one. You need, you need this investment from kind of a, a some version of a system around you. Um, and so I think finding those writers and those voices and pairing them with people, it's TV. I mean, film and music are also collaborative, but television being the episodic nature of it, that it's not a one and done. It's a ongoing thing yeah. for whatever you've decided that length or, or whatever, whatever you're allowed that length to be, you need a lot of people and support around you. So I think that's where we're, we want to find the, the people and help them through the door is. How do you 
teach them and give them access to decision makers and opportunity to tell their stories more than go make it. And then if it's good, we'll, we'll buy it kind of thing. Well, sure. also pilots are really hard. I mean, think of all the yeah. terrible, the amazing shows, shows terrible yeah, yeah. mainstream yeah. shows that their pilots are terrible. When you see a really great pilot, even for a mainstream network or streaming show, you're like, wow, that pilot was really great. And it's almost a surprise. Mm-hmm. Pilots are really, really tough. And so an independent pilot, you even have even more cards stacked against you. So sure. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I could see like some sort of like Shark Tank show where you got these like film producers up there and you bring in your television show or what your pilot or your movie or whatever. Right. And you like pitch it to that could be a good show. I don't want that that out there. That is essentially our pitch competition. So like essentially our pitch competition, it's based on an elevator pitch. So you have you submit a video. It's 90 seconds. You pitch your show. Anybody can have a good idea for a show. You do submit a writing sample because in television, if you can't write some of it, you're probably not going to sell your show. That makes total sense. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I'd want to see something, right? Something on a napkin yeah. or something, yeah. right? Yeah. So Absolutely. you pitch your show in 90 seconds, you submit it. We screen it through multiple rounds. And in the end, we get 10 finalists who now get three minutes to pitch yeah. to a panel of judges and okay. then get a question and answer period. Yeah. They listen to all of them and then they pick a winner. And up until now, what we've had a few sell but not be made or they're paid to write the pilot. We've gotten people that get representation out of it. Um, it's been really fun. We haven't had the one that's been made yet. Yeah. But in not eight years now, eight, eight uh, competitions, completed competitions, I'd say half of them, if not more, it has led them to a community that has gotten them something, be it Some of them have decided not to be writers and they're, you know, executives, but they met kind of their tribe that helped them through. Um, Some have gotten management or agents. Um, Some have been paid to write their pilots. It just, that was at that point. Yeah. What what are some, uh, do you remember any like cool pitches that stick out to you? I mean, I'm trying to think of the ones that like one, the one that we loved the most and went really far was one called incoming. And it was all set in a, in a veterans assisted live assisted living. Yeah. Okay. It reminded me a lot of the show rescue me. Um, okay. Where yeah. it was just a lot of broken characters, but this, this like setting, a dark comedy. Yeah. It was a dark comedy, but it looked at like, you know, veterans affairs currently, but it had just like, if you think about it, like an assisted living facility would be older people, but these were all aged people that were there for any variety of reasons and like the mental health and the trauma, but it was funny. And there was like, you know, politics and relationships. It was great. It just, it just didn't go any further. (laughs) Damn. Yeah. That does sound good. I mean, yeah, you've got the youth with the old mixing, telling stories, right? Like all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, that sounds cool. That must be great to hear all those pitches. And uh, that that's what would be exciting for me to hear all these new ideas. And what could I will be. say last year is the first time because we did the pitch competition virtual. So it's the first time that because normally during the festival, we do the finale live at the festival. And Kate and I, I think we can both count on one hand in almost 10 years, how many panels or Q&As we have gotten to sit through the entire thing of because we're oh, normally wow. running around. So we program sure. all these, but we don't experience any of the programming <laughs> and including the pitch finale. So like, we'll know about the pitches and we'll meet all the finalists, but we don't get to just like sit and watch the pitches. But last year, because it was virtual, I did the whole thing via Zoom. And so since I was leading it actually, and Kate, I think you got to watch the whole thing too, mm-hmm. but got to actually sit and watch all 10 pitches. And it was the first time that I've gotten to do that. Oh, wow. it, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you the number of people who, my parents included the pitch finale is their favorite thing that happens at the festival. They love yeah, it. So much. Absolutely. And, it's so exciting. and watching it, I was like, this is really cool. This is yeah. really fun to hear these ideas and hear, especially our judges are always so great and so giving of their time. And like to hear the questions they ask and the thoughts that they have. Cause then I also got to sit in on the deliberation with the judges were talking through who right. they thought should win and how they were going through each pitch. And it was a really cool experience that I feel like I'd missed out on for eight years and finally got to be a part of and see. And I was like this, I get why this is people's favorite. 
<laughs> oh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Any sort of competition, any sort of like rooting for somebody to get something mm -hmm. right. Like that's, uh, that's what people get behind. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. You know what I do want to talk about? You guys are experts on TV here. You know, whether you want to admit it, whether you want to admit it or not, you, you somehow are, you know, it's just, it's inevitable. Somehow become uh, that. You know, absolutely. Um, you know, we mentioned this before that television has changed so much. That is absolutely true. It's not what it, I'm 41 and, you know, growing up watching television, it's just not obviously just not even anywhere close to what it is now. Just watching it, the content that's, that's come out, right? Both sides of it, the, my experience, and also the other, you know, the studio's experience, it's all changed. I'm curious, when do y'all think that change happened? For me, it was like True Detective, that first season mm -hmm. of True Detective. I remember thinking, whoa, mm -hmm. TV, you know, even though like Sopranos, you write The Wire, some different stuff. Sure. I don't know. There was something about that particular show that just changed I something for me. I mean, I would feel, so we, the, the first festival was 2012. And so when we started planning it in 2011, the reason that it re even really started talking about it was because that summer, summer 2011, people started talking about more what was on TV than what was in the box office. They were Got just it. like outside of like Game of Thrones and Breaking yeah. Bad. And yes. these shows that were launching, people were really excited about. And we're like, this is a really cool time. And we just, I mean, all stars aligned in that exact place, but it really, that is when it felt like the transition started happening, that people were just much more excited and wanting to talk about what was happening on their small screens than what was going on in theaters. Well, I think two, two things kind of happened at once, which was, well, actually a lot of things happened at once. Emily's completely right. Like those types of shows, but as much as I hate to admit it, it was, Netflix streaming even changed the shows that weren't Netflix. So like Netflix that year, that same year launched house of cards, which was very different for a lot of people. Yes. But, but Vince Gilligan will tell you that breaking bad going to Netflix changed people watching breaking bad. The access to how people were watching changed how they were talking about it because before, if you missed it, you were sort of like, I mean, I guess I can find it on DVD or something, but then all of a sudden you're sitting there and you're like, well, I missed the, I mean, it's how I watch Breaking Bad, but it was in like season three. And I was kind of like, this isn't really for me. And then somebody <laughs> talked me into it and it had, it was both the way I was watching it and the way they were making it because Breaking Bad was a slower show yeah. and it wasn't until you kind of got to a certain point in it, that it got this momentum of like combined knowledge about this character that like yes. made you invested, yeah. but that becomes easier to engage with if you could watch all of season one in a week versus yeah. week to week. And so I think like it even changed the way that people watch game of Thrones or went back and watched the wire. People will always tell you, and I, I do love the wire, but it's a hard show to start watching <laughs> the number of people that are like, watch eight episodes. You got to like sit down and watch eight episodes. And by the time you get to episode eight, you're starting to understand what's going on, but you still need to keep going before you fully understand what's happening. Well, and all of that's so true because even the fact that, one, how you can consume shows. You can consume like a few episodes together to like really get into it. But also there are certain shows that don't really hit their stride or start coming together until later on. And so, but at that yeah. point, the people that have watched them and are talking about it for everyone else is like, you're right, Kate, like I missed it. But all of a sudden something between seasons three and four of a show, you could go back, watch the first three seasons and catch up and start watching season four. And so I mean, Breaking Bad is the prime example. And yeah. I think Breaking Bad, the show, and how you could consume you? It on Netflix, those two things yeah. together did automatically, all of a sudden people are talking about this show and anyone that missed it can now join the conversation. And that was, I mean, the HBO shows as well. Like people yeah. were all of a sudden, oh, these shows that I thought I was never going to get to see yeah. can now go watch and be part of whatever happens next. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. I mean, yeah. And that's the way television should be, right? It should be like, you kind of need to watch a few episodes to get in it. Now, granted, I realize there's shows that are, you know, you know, like Law and Order, right? Don't, don't, don't. I just it begins, <laughs> it ends. That right. that's the show. You you don't really yeah. need to watch yes. more. I get that, and that's that's great. But yeah, these television shows that spread out the story, you do need to watch the combined knowledge. Um, 
you know, comment. I, I can, I, I relate to that a lot. Absolutely. You know, you're more invested because you know all these things about it. And if you watch it with somebody that doesn't know, you're like all excited to tell them <laughs> the whole backstory of all these things, you know, no, this guy's connected to him and his mother and his sister and what, you know, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, it, because it's a, it is a slow burn. They just give you a couple of cool details in one episode, but it all adds up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a great example. Um, what, what sort of, what do you see more coming out now? like as far as styles of shows that surprise you are there any styles of shows that are coming out that sort of surprise you, you thought oh i would i thought i would never see that on tv i mean the one that like shocked me i don't know about like if it's the exact style but uh wandavision this year like yeah was i've just never seen anything like it and there's a new show coming out uh called kevin can f himself on amc that i think is doing a very similar thing i wouldn't have thought somebody else would do this which is it's like, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, I guess it's genre bending is that it's a Marvel show, yeah. but it's set in these historic television shows. It goes across like decades. And at the beginning, you're sort of like, what are they doing? And totally. I'm enjoying it because I love television. I was sitting there with my husband who loves television, but doesn't know as much as I do. So I was like, this is like, I love Lucy. This one's like family ties. This one's like step-by-step, -step, like he didn't understand. I can't even really explain to what they did, but the swing that they took to oh, still wow. tell a Marvel story and tell a superhero story was, it was it like kind of blows my mind. I think it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Emily? I would say, I mean, I was trying to think of, uh, I feel that there's a whole different way people are making TV now. That's not as, the cliffhangers are different these days because people know you're going to go one into the next where I feel like back, back in the day, like thinking of shows like 24 or prison break, or those more uh, shows that leave you with some sort of anxiety and some sort of like really what's going to happen next. So you have to come back immediately. Now they have to shift them a little bit because no commercials. Yeah. You're, and you're immediately going to go to the next episode. And that's yeah, like, yeah, hey, that's you're watching. I was talking to, oh, oh, I was talking to friends the other day about Veronica Mars, which was a UPN CW ish show that, you know, Kristen then, Bell, right? Is that who was Kristen in that? Bell, yeah. yeah. And the season one ends with, I mean, this is no spoilers here, but yeah. season one <laughs> ends with Veronica opening her front door and someone is on the other side of it and you don't know who it is. And that's how season one ends. And you had to wait three months to figure out who was on the other side of the door. And you talked to your friends about it and you speculated and you even spent three months deciding who you wanted it to be. Felicity, sure. an old CW show or WB show also kind of ends that way. And then, you know, then you come back and there's all this excitement about it. Whereas now, especially when people are streaming it, you automatically go to the next episode and there's no anticipation. You find out within five minutes who the person was on the other side of the door. And it just doesn't have oh, that's the, interesting. Effect or the same attachment. And yeah. I can tell from friends that are watching shows that way, where you just stream it straight through that the, they don't care as much who's on the other side of the door because you don't spend three months wondering about it. Wow. <laughs> that like the who shot JR yeah. sort of idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I get it. I get it. Yeah. You're right. I mean, that's a good point. Um, well, there's just so much content. You're like, dude, I got another show to watch, right? So it's yeah. like, there's a million shows to watch now that are amazing. You yeah. can't even catch up on all the amazing yeah. shows, right? That's I also think that TV creators, unless you're making like Grey's Anatomy, you don't know that you're coming back, which they never did. They never really knew. But I think that the concept that you could be a single show and you could stand alone as that series, there's a pressure to make it kind of complete. So cliffhangers, sure. even if you're not coming back for a year, is harder unless they know, like, I get three, se like Ted Lasso, they know that they're doing two more seasons. Like they got Correct. picked up two more at a time. So they can do season two differently, knowing that they get season three than if they don't. They didn't I don't know. know. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I that's see. a cliffhanger, going to be a cliffhanger, but they at least have the ability to like leave you hanging for six months if they want to. But I think that, that it's also the way they're being made, not just the way they're being watched that is changing how they're telling those stories. They're also, with the exception of the Law and Orders and the Grey's Anatomies and whatnot, 22, 24 episodes are just a thing of the past. They're 
yeah that's so much right oh, that's, that's like so yeah, yeah yeah i that's better i think in my i'd rather have better quality yeah in my opinion you know um i think it's yeah. better. Yeah. A lot of creators talked about like in a 22 or 24 episode show, they might have had like 18 good episodes, but like as writers, there were the episodes. I remember we did a panel on the old show, Nash Bridges. Yes. Yeah. Writers. <laughs> Don <laughs> Johnson. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The writers are amazing. It's like Glenn Mazzara and Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse were all in this writer's room. And they were like, you know, you inevitably get to like episode 19 and you're like, I don't know what to do. Could we like bring in a monkey? <laughs> and there's like an episode with John Johnson and a monkey because they had nowhere to go. Sure. So, absolutely. And it's a terrible episode and they'll say it's a terrible episode, but they just needed to do something. And, and then we, brought- oddly enough, it's like the fans favorite episode. Yeah, oh, sure. Always. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I read about uh, M. Night Shyamalan, same thing on Apple, where he agreed to do Servant because he knew. I'm going to do X amount of seasons. Like yeah. I need to, I need to know I can start the story and end it. And if I know, you know, where that's going to be and how long it's going to, and blah, blah, blah. He didn't want to do it. Otherwise I yeah. like that. I mean, I, yeah. again, you're going to get better content. And that's honestly one of my favorite shows out is that servant show. It's um, so I, creepy. I, I love it. Well, I'm a, you know, I work in food. I'm a chef that, you know, the food scenes they have and the uh-huh. way they do that is amazing. It's the <laughs> best thing. I honestly, it's the best I've ever seen on TV, like the yeah. way they film it, the way they show it, how realistic it is. And yeah, it's 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 the absolutely the most realistic I've ever seen on any show or movie or they always do it wrong. Yeah, never. They, they, yeah, so it's all, funny. That actually makes me want to watch it, whereas I haven't watched it because I'm a chicken. And so anything like creepy or horror ish, I stay away from. But the fact that you're like, but the food on it makes me a little more intrigued by what's happening. It's like half the story is like him just making espressos and making, you know, uh, <laughs> meals and like prepping shit. And it's, it's cool. It's going to make me hungry. I'm so yeah. <laughs> easily susceptible. The number of times I pour myself a glass of wine watching Grace and Frankie because all Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin are doing is drinking <laughs> wine. I am so easily, it doesn't matter. It could be bourbon, coffee. There haven't like that movie Spanglish. He makes an egg sandwich that like, as yes. all you want to do is eat that sandwich. Like I love one of our favorite, we do love food travel shows. And uh, Phil Rosenthal is a, a favorite of ours. Uh, uh, he's a festival sure. favorite. He's on our advisory board. But like, I have a hard time sometimes watching his show because all I want to do is one, get on a plane that I couldn't get on for the last year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and to eat whatever pastry he's eating, like <laughs> mission care. accomplished. They did yeah. it right. If you want it, yeah. that's the that's Agreed. the goal. You know, yeah, that's a great show, by the way. His show, I love that show. Uh, yeah, that that's a great show. Now I will say this: um, I love the guy. I love everything he's made. I love every. You know, this is just coming from a chef perspective, and like friends. You know, we always talk yeah. about these shows and whatever. It is cool, but from a fan's perspective, like. I, I don't know how many chefs really watch his show. Well, probably, yeah. It's more a travel show. Like his point Correct. of his show is to get people to travel and to do it through food. To say it's like, totally. hey, you want to ex- you want to understand culture, understand their foods. Um, That's absolutely so true. He, yeah, he. I, I would even say like, I love his excitement for the yes. food. That's yeah. what gets me. It's, so like, it's contagious. Yeah. It's like it is. He is like in love with that stuff. And it makes me want to uh, be there too. Yeah. And I I get that feeling. Yeah. He wants to do the like, when you go to New Orleans, find the old lady that's been there forever cooking gumbo, but then also go to this new spot. He will also tell you he does not cook. He is not a chef. Sure. (laughs) Loves to eat, but he does not cook. That's okay. (laughs) Chefs need those people. (laughs) Yeah. Right. That's what chefs need. I don't care to be that person. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you know, to be honest with you, you know, most chefs, they do love food and they do love eating, but they don't really get a lot of time to eat mm-hmm. great and to do these things. So to be honest, like it's those people coming in that enjoy your food because you're not going to eat that. You're, right. you're, you're sitting on a milk crate on behind the line, crouched down, shoving something in your face, sure. you know, to get to, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the yeah. reality of it. Uh, this is, you know. Well, I want to ask you a question that has nothing to do with television, but did you, well, actually it does now. He has a TV show with it. The movie chef. Yeah. And then the chef show. Does yeah. that do accurate ish things? with the, the chef, 
the chef movie I relate to 100% because I had a food truck in Austin for five years. So I mm -hmm. went through that whole experience. Uh, so that that I can connect with immediately. Yes, it's exaggerated. It's a film. OK, sure. let's just be real. Um, right. Yeah, that, that's just the truth of it. It's just exaggerated. And it's a film. Are there some real things in there? Yeah, there's a few real moments. Uh, but yeah. for the most part, it's exaggerated. Now, the show he does on Netflix, mm -hmm. that is legit. I do. That's I like it a lot. Great show. Yeah. yeah, phenomenal show. But I get why they did the movie the way they mm -hmm. did. I mean, it's yeah. a movie. You yeah, can't really look. It took me like three weeks to clean out my food truck. They did it in an afternoon in the movie yeah. in a parking lot <laughs> with two right. dudes. Right, yeah. like not going to happen like that. Uh, and you're not going to get a fan base so quick. You're not going to have a line out the door. You know, you can't just park anywhere and serve food like they would do in the movie. It's right. just weird things like that. But yeah. it's still a great film. They still he respects mm -hmm. the industry and he respects right. So th yeah, mm -hmm. that comes across, and that's what people from my industry want to see just that you respect it doesn't necessarily need to be really accurate just you know like you respect just the same pro, you know a war veteran watching a war movie or whatever right you, you're you see your industry on the screen you know that's what you're going to want out of it so yeah that's yeah. a really cool perspective because i feel like so many people when they're watching a tv show that's based in their area whatever their profession is or something yeah. that they know you know i mean you just said it correctly like it's a movie. It's a TV show. It's not going to be completely accurate because there's not usually enough drama. And yeah, you got to have entertainment. I agree. Like it's not that interesting. I'm. It may not be that interesting to watch you cook a whole meal. Maybe exactly. If you montage it into five minutes. It could be exactly. interesting. But maybe not yes. the whole thing. But that element of respect of like at least you're respecting whatever this profession is or whatever this group is that you're showcasing. And I feel like that sometimes is what missing. And if people would go into it saying may not be 100% accurate for specific reasons, but as long as we respect the story we're telling, that I feel like that would go a long way. Absolutely. Are you kidding? If it, like every action movie needed to be completely accurate, they would all suck, <laughs> right? Like, we, we, I mean, let's be real, right? We want to see big explode. We want to see people do things that, you know, you can't mm -hmm. do. So like, that's not, that doesn't bother me. Yeah, again, it's all about yeah. the respect and and I'm in. And even if they don't respect that, what does it really bother me at the end of the day? Like, I don't care. I mean, if it's a good movie or a good show, I'm in. I don't care. You know, I don't, it's not, not, not that important to me, to be honest. I just want to see good content. I mean, that's, that's it. I, I want to walk story. away going, that was awesome, you know, or whatever uh, the case would be. Let, let, let's, let's, let me ask you all this. What's your favorite show on TV right now? That's tough, I'm sure, to answer. You can give a couple. I like of that the question, though, is like, what's your favorite TV show on TV right now? So they, a lot of people ask us of all time, and that no, has no. to have a whole breakdown of genre. That's impossible. Yeah, exactly. And all yeah. sorts of things. I know, I'm trying to think, because, well, first off, I'm usually months behind. On whatever <laughs> Me channel. too. I watch Me TV too. extremely <laughs> slowly. So something comes out and everyone watches it in a weekend. And then six months later, I'm like, guys, I'm watching this show that no one's talking about anymore. And You're like Tiger King. They're like, what? Dude, we were <laughs> like, nope, gone. Conversation. The last, the last one that we all really loved, and it, it wasn't that long ago, was a show on Amazon called The Wilds. Um, oh, oh, was that like an island or something? Mm -hmm. no? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I could have sworn it was based on a book, just the way it felt. And it is not, but, uh, it was just like really interesting casting. Uh, it took us by surprise. There's very few shows that cross over in our office. We, we are four women, but we are four very different women who like very different things. Mm -hmm. And rarely do we all like the same show within the same time period. And we, we did, it was very interesting, but I really liked the wilds. I'm going to give that another shot. I watched like half of the first episode. I was I don't know about this. <laughs> it is also like, beautifully shot. Like as it goes, like it yeah. feels like very cinematic. Okay. Right on. I'm in. I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm trying to think what I know. I'm trying to think what I just finished watching. This happens to everybody. Trust me. This happens I to me. I, I can't even think of one. I just asked y'all. I feel horrible. Like, yeah, no, we should also have things at the very top of our list that we, that we love. Um, Wanda well, look, people, people will ask, one. yeah, oh, WandaVision, WandaVision was, I did love was one. really good. What about the Captain America Falcon? No, nope. um, I've seen the yeah. first one. It is more of a, it's so far is more of a straightforward, like Marvel movie. I like Marvel movies yeah. just fine, but sure. it didn't like 
WandaVision, I wouldn't have even told you at the beginning that I thought it was like good or that I liked it. I was just so curious about what was happening Me too. that I kept going. I yeah. per- currently, in planning the festival, we often find things that we rewatch. Emily has seen Shit's Creek like four times. No, more. Like 12 <laughs> times. Probably like eight times. Yeah. But it's- um, <laughs> Who's counting at this point? <laughs> <laughs> and I, weirdly enough, like I'll end up, put, it's the things that like can somewhat be on in the background. We call it uh, passive viewing versus active viewing. Active viewing is like all devices down, all yeah. of my attention, nobody talk. Last night I watched the pilot of Mayor of Easttown on HBO. Oh, oh with uh, Kate Winslet or no? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Very focused. Very. It had me. I've, there's only two episodes out. I've only seen one. It was very good. Um, but the passive viewing that I have had going on that will continue throughout the festival is Grey's Anatomy. Okay. I had watched it through se- originally. I, I, one of the greatest. Talk about a good pilot. One of the greatest pilots of all time. Like it's a fantastic pilot. I remember watching it in 2005 when it came out. Like all of these things. I sat down to watch the pilot uh, maybe like two months ago and I am now in the middle of season nine <laughs> because it just 22 all, episode seasons. Right? Some of them have 20. Oh my God. Episodes. One oh. of them had 17. Well, that uh, even, evens out. But hilariously, like I broke up with this show in season 11 being like, I don't know when this is ending. I cannot spend any more time here. <laughs> it is now in season 17. Wow. And the number of people that told me that I think it's around 14 or 15, it gets good again, quote unquote, it gets good again. That is not (laughs) why I started watching this. I didn't have a plan. I didn't actively make a choice. It has just passively been on in the mornings and at night, like they just rolled straight through. And I think I'm just going to have to keep going. Yeah. Don't stop. Keep going. And related to that, actually, so the showrunner, current showrunner for Grey's Anatomy is this woman, Krista Vernoff. And she wrote originally on it, left for a bit. And now she took over the last couple of seasons when it got good again. And her whole thing with Shonda Rhimes, the creator was, if I'm going to take over this, you have to like actually give me this show. You can't. Correct. Can't, one like, foot in, one foot out. In. Yeah. Yep. And so Shonda had, and there were like three bullet points that Shonda like got to have opinions on. One is like, who does Meredith Grey end up with, like, love interest-wise? And, like, that's the only opinion she gets. <laughs> but Krista, previous, I mean, has done 11 pilots that haven't gone forward until this year. She has a new wow. show called Rebel, starring Katie Seagal. That just oh, started. yeah. I saw a trailer or something for that. Yeah. So I've been watching it, and it's, I mean, it has a bit of that the Grey's scandal feel to it, but Katie Seagal is one of the coolest people in the whole world. I and it's agree. based like the character is based on Aaron Brockovich, who's a producer on the show. And it's, oh, it's wow. a fun show. And Katie Seagal is awesome. And it is bringing me joy and I'm watching it. So it's only three episodes out, but I, uh, it's, it's fun. It's a fun network show. And she's just, she's so cool. I mean, she's 67 years old. And if I could be that at 67, wow, like, I would have never guessed that. Oh. Right. Uh, nope. Really, I would have never guessed that. Wow, holy cow! Yeah, she's come a long way uh, since Married yeah. with Children, right? Oh, yes. Sure. I mean, I used to love her on that show. I mean, she was hands down just an amazing actress on that show. Well, and then did you watch Sons of Anarchy? She's so good. Yes, yes, of course, absolutely. Yeah, she's awesome on that. She's just amazing actress. She's mm-hmm. just, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's a cool show. I have seen that um, for sure. That's a good one. I think, uh, all right, I'll throw one out real quick. I mean, maybe y'all saw it. It was on Amazon, uh, just because I just thought of it. Y'all were saying uh, Amazon. Besides a servant being one of my favorite shows, it's called Utopia. Mm-hmm. Oh, I yeah. I saw that. I thought that was like, I'm really into sci-fi and yeah. futuristic stuff. I don't, you know, I like that stuff. Black Mirror, right? I like all this stuff. Um, it was a phenomenal, I thought it was a phenomenal show. I cannot wait for the next season. Uh, that's how I know, yeah, I, yeah, right? You like the show. I can't wait to yeah. see yeah, yeah. Right, yes. what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And that's did you binge show. it all straight through or did you? Pretty it? much. No, I pretty much, because I loved it so much. Mm-hmm. Now, if I don't like it so much, I will mm-hmm. pro- maybe never even finish the season. Yeah. Right, I'll just keep, watch a few, but that, yeah, I sort of uh, benched. It was so good. The next one, the, the smartest thing these things do is the autoplay for the next yeah, episode. It really okay? is. It really is. Do you, do you feel judged when Netflix stops and says, are you still watching? <laughs> like, yes, yes, I am. How dare you? 
How yes. dare Yeah, I just like cuddle in my blank. I'm like, yes, I'm still yes, watching. Clearly, I'm still watching. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's a funny thing that they do that, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That is so funny. All right, well, what what else uh, did I not bring up or anything you guys um, want to mention? I mean, I think that's mostly it. I mean, that this year, obviously, anyone can attend. We are doing a 10-day pass, like a 10-day pass, a single-day pass, or a single okay. event pass. So Smart. you can do any number of things to join. Um, we will. We just did our first programming announcement, which does have... Oh, gosh, I'll have to like actually look at it. I should say things that we've announced. We're honoring Michael J. Fox this year, which oh, we've wow. heard every year, and we are very, very excited. Oh my! Um, wow. We love him so much, and he That's very funny. quickly and graciously accepted. So, we're oh honored. really? Oh my gosh! Wow! So y'all gonna get to talk to him at the? Yep. Wow. So it'll be um, virtual, but we'll do a, like a one-on-one conversation with him about his life. He has a new book out, and just sort of oh like where God. he is and. He is such, obviously, he's just an amazing type of person, but like he, he obviously was on family ties, but like even in most recent years, he was on, he's been on the good wife and the good fight with like yep. really cool television arcs. Um, Shit, Spin City. The people yeah. shouldn't forget about yeah, Spin City. City. Correct. Um, so we're honoring him. We'll have a conversation with him. Um, we're doing an Oz reunion, which was HBO's first drama series. So like talk about like where we've come and where we're going. That show sort of set the tone for HBO. We're doing a little cult classic three season, um, show called faking it, which was not filmed in Austin, but was set in Austin. Um, and has a a very, like the, the people were interesting. They were supposed to be in Austin, but they didn't film here. That's interesting. Um, yeah. We will most definitely, although it is unannounced, we will have something Friday Night Lights for people because it's Austin. Our festival was sort of built on the back of Friday Night Lights in many ways. We can't be in our 10th year without having some some good Friday Night Lights content. Um, so I think, yeah, the thing we're excited about is that there will be live stuff and VOD stuff. And Emily and I are going to host a morning show every day where we're out and about in Austin, you know, eating to tie it to you. But just because I I don't know if you're aware, even as a television festival, we are very food and drink focused. You have to be like to pair our lives and at the festival. (laughs) We we love Austin brands. We pair things. We, we have happy hours that have TV themed cocktails we have coffee together. We'll have, you know, Austin coffee. We'll be out and about on South Congress, sort of just, you know, hopefully that's another way we're sharing it together is where last year we gave everybody, we'll do it this year, a grocery list. If they want to, you know, eat and drink with us during the week, then go get their Joe's coffee or yeah. find their favorite breakfast taco and like do those sorts of things. Cause especially if you're at home and watching TV, you've got to have good, you have to have good snacks. And a good drink. Yes. Um, so I agree with all that. <laughs> it'll be very, it'll be very fun. Like I think we're excited to like add those elements because that's the other part about the festival, especially when it was physical, and now definitely when it's virtual, is it was very purposefully in Austin. Like you could have been anywhere. We didn't want to be in LA or New York. We also didn't want Austin to feel like it was LA or New York. It was you're in Austin and we, and we sold it the first year. You may not know who we are, but you're coming to Austin for the weekend. Like how terrible could it be? Do your panel and then go find yourself a delicious margarita. Um, so we've (laughs) always like leaned into that, you know, it was the Alamo draft house and the Stephen F Austin and these very Austin-y things. And so we're trying to infuse that into the festival as well so that you see that you are in Austin, not, Absolutely. In your living room or wherever it is. Yeah. And, and then as soon as you can come to Austin, do that safely. Agreed. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Emily, did you want to add anything? I'm sorry, I don't want to. I mean, she did uh, everything that she said. I feel like <laughs> really uh, this year we're launch basically launching our 10th year with the festival. So the whole year will be celebration of 10 years. So I feel like this is we're packing as much as possible into the 10 days, but then really looking at how do we celebrate this past decade of 
ATX, but then of, you know, what's happened in television the past 10 years and where it's going. So I think that anything that we can't, for whatever reason, put in these 10 days, we will be doing all year long. And that's really fun for us too, is that it's a continuous celebration that we just get to kick off in June. Love that. Yep. Let me ask y'all a quick one last question. This is, uh, I'm just curious about this. W- would y'all ever have like, uh, you know, a podcast set up? Like, so, say for instance, uh, you know, we wanted to like do a live, you know, recording of a podcast. We've never done anything like that. I'm just curious. I'm spitballing here. Is that something like festivals have been doing, right? Where they have, I don't know. Um, yeah, is that something y'all would do. ever consider? Yeah, I think, yes, it is. Last, we had a few years uh, when it was a physical festival, and it will be again. Mm -hmm. Um, We had sort of a podcast corner, we called it Podcast HQ, where both we recorded and then different, usually television critics, but there were other versions of it, could like book out that corner. And we actually had it all set up with audio and things like that. So you could book guests from the festival, do that. But the place we were working to evolve to is one Podcast and television have gone hand in hand a lot. Like a lot of podcasts have been developed into television shows is to sort of, because podcasts are also so episodic, I actually think more than movies, podcast and TV kind of go hand in hand. So I think we would want to do more programming with podcasts, more conversations. We like to release, I think a lot of our panels are great podcasts more than they're great videos because you don't need to just see four writers talking about something, but listening to four writers talk about something is very intimate, which is so much what our festival is. It's intimate, it's accessible. Sure. And that's what podcast conversations are. It's like you're inviting people into your your ears, but you're like you're you're having a conversation with them. And I think we are more like that than even a film festival in some ways. So yeah, I think I think there's a lot of things to do with podcasts, both live capture. Um, and talking about them and, and what, how people interact with podcasts, I think is a very intimate sort of relationship, the same way that you watch TV in a very kind of intimate way. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to take this, uh, we're going to start doing live with an audience and yeah. we want to do like a tour and, and have that sort of interaction. Yeah. And um, I know we've, you know, talked about in our meetings of getting out into different yeah. festivals and going and see when what, just seeing what we can do, you know, yeah. just pushing, pushing the limits, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, right. There's no rules I get entirely uh, set up not around anymore. it. So yeah, not yeah. anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And every, uh, aspect right in every medium mm-hmm. for sure Absolutely. Yep. well that's awesome well you probably be hearing from us then for the next uh for for <laughs> yes. the 11th year right there you go yes yes in person no that's awesome um well listen guys this is um this has been amazing what whoa i i tell you what we we got to tell people where like online to yep. check out that sort of thing yep uh atxfestival.com so atx <laughs> like I don't, I don't you can't fanatic. fill it out any more than that. No, nope, you really can't. No, nope. festival.com <laughs> uh, has all your information, and then all our social handles are at ATX Festival, so they can get all that info there. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, guys, this has been amazing. I've absolutely truly enjoyed this uh conversation, mm-hmm. I must say. Us no, too. Very fun. I mean, we obviously love talking about TV. So anytime you just want to chat about it. Yep. Right. For your four. Yep. Ten I days in June. Just to talk yeah. about TV for 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> we spend all year talking about TV and, and sure. privately, right? Everyone does. Right? Uh, so yeah, absolutely. No, this is awesome. Uh really do appreciate y'all's time. Uh and again, thank y'all for being patient there at the beginning, uh, as we got absolutely. started. Absolutely. Oh, no worries. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, guys. Well, enjoy the rest of your week. And Thank can't you. wait for uh, June. Hope everything goes well. I'm sure it will. Um, and let's see. Maybe I'll be there for to view a panel. I'll check sure. it out. And uh, I, I, I'm all about that stuff. So that yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, Thank you so awesome, much. Awesome, guys. Thank, Thank you all so much. Have a good Y'all day. be good. You Bye-bye. too. Bye bye. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Thank you.